morning, everybody, and happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful women out there today. I'm so glad you could join us for this fifth Sunday of Easter, this time of worship. This morning, we continue to proclaim the power of the empty tomb, and we continue to claim the name of people of the resurrection. And this morning, we also celebrate the women who have cared for us and shaped us in our lives. This week, as part of Mother's Day, I, I ran across a blog post that speaks what I believe to be the very heart of what Mother's Day is all about. So I'm going to share that with you now as part of our Mother's Day observation. It's called, Every Woman a Mother, Every Person a Child. I have had the incredible privilege of walking through life with some amazing women, women from all walks of life and in every season of life. I have rejoiced with women who were newly engaged and felt the hurt with women when their promised ones walked away, cried tears of joy with women who were uniting their lives with the love of their life, and cried tears of despair with some of those same women whose, li whose loves have broken that bond. I have waited anxiously for this first sound of a newborn's cry and felt the pain and loss of children not meant for this life. Cheered during announcements of new conceptions and wept with dear friends when their empty arms became a heavy burden. I have shared in giving praise when friends would embark upon fostering young ones and celebrated the blessings of adoption with many. I've been witness to grandmothers and aunts all become moms by choice and watched in heartwarming amazement as friends would take in children who weren't blood related to them at all, not wanting a single thing in return, only to show love to those who needed it most. So on this Mother's Day, I am reminded that you do not have to have physically given birth to be a mom. Oh no, not at all. Sweet woman, when you have wiped the tear of a child who has skinned their knee, brushed back the hair of a young woman who is surf suffering a broken heart, or quieted the frightened cry of one who has lost all that is familiar to them, you, dear one, are the most loving mother of all. As we take time to celebrate our own mothers, and allow our children to celebrate us, let's be quick to remember the importance of having our eyes wide open to seeing those who are consistently loving loud by giving their time, money, and abilities to unconditionally pour into the lives of others. And let us not only see them with our eyes, but let us honor them with our words and our time. Use spoken word to encourage and renew them and take time to honor them, thanking them for their love. May we live each day awestruck to every woman a mother and every person a child. So happy Mother's Day. I would invite you, as I do each week, that if you have joined us for this time of worship, drop a comment below and let us know that you're here with us. And now, dear ones, let's begin our time to worship with a call to worship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we come to worship following your way. We come to worship in order to know the truth. We come to worship to find life. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Lord, in this time of worship, release us from the troubles that weigh us down. Amen. And now if you'll bow with me. Holy God, you bid us come, and so this morning we come. We gather together in this unique, very different way to fellowship and to worship and praise you. 
Help us each to set aside all that would distract us from being fully present. Open our ears to hear what you would have us hear. Soften our hearts and spirits that they may be molded into what you would have us be. Accept, dear Lord, this time of worship. May it bring glory and honor to you and restoration and renewal to us. Amen. This morning our reading from the psalm comes from Psalm 31, and I'll be reading just selected verses from that psalm. And again this morning I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. O oh Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me. Rescue me quickly. Be my rock of protection, a fortress where I will be safe. You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this danger. Pull me from the trap my enemies set for me, for I find protection in you alone. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant. In your unfailing love, rescue me. Don't let me be disgraced, O Lord, for I call out to you for help. Let the wicked be disgraced. Let them lie silent in the grave. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. Praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. He kept me safe when my city was under attack. In panic, I cried out, I am cut off from the Lord, but you heard my cry for mercy and answered my call for help. Love the Lord, all you godly ones, for the Lord protects those who are loyal to him, but he harshly punishes the arrogant. So be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. Amen. And now I would bid you to go to God in prayer with me as we pray a prayer of confession. Almighty God, we come in this moment confessing that we have fallen short. We have done things that break your heart and we've left undone things that you have commanded us to do. Forgive us, we pray. Empower us to lay aside those shortcomings and then to model our lives after the example of your blessed Son. And now, dear God, we offer to you our own voices of confession. We pray and confess all these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus who shows us the way. Amen. And now hear these words of assurance. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God's forgiveness, healing, and restoration is always available for us because our sins and shortcomings have been taken away, hung on the cross with our Savior. Know that you are forgiven and that you are loved beyond measure. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come now when we share our joys and concerns with one another, and we lift as we do each week our Everett and Isabella, James Perry, Bubba, Carol, Joe and Lala, Virginia, Pat and Al and Barbara Hurst, we also lift, uh, lift the caregivers who often struggle 
on the sidelines as they give their all to take care of their beloved. We lift all those who are ill, those who are isolated and lonely, those who grieve. And this morning especially, we lift those for whom Mother's Day is a bittersweet occasion, maybe even difficult, those who have lost their mother, those who long for nothing more than to become a mother, those who didn't have the mother that they had wished for, and those who couldn't be a mom. And we lift those as well who are estranged from their mother or mothers who are estranged for their children from their children. We lift as we have each week those who are facing and fighting this virus on the front lines, all the medical community, our truck drivers, our grocery workers, our scientists and researchers. We lift, of course, our leaders, our political leaders, and our faith leaders as they make difficult decisions. We lift all those that we see who are suffering because of this pandemic, those who are suffering financially and, and just suffering in ways that we may not even know. I continue to thank those of you who are sending in your tithes and offerings and I encourage you to continue to do so in these difficult times. And now let me share a, an update with you, a joy over the feeding program that's going on at church. If you're part of social media, you probably saw that on Friday, we gave out or delivered 1,140 lunches. Now remember, our first day, we started on March 23rd and gave out 37. The increase, uh, increasing need is just staggering. And we continue to send home the weekend grocery bags. I just lift to you this program and ask that you continue to lift the feeding in your prayers as we continue to try to meet the needs. And we have been selected to be a summer feeding site for the YMCA that will begin after May 22nd. The Shelby County Schools partnership will end that day because that's the day that school would have ended. But we will continue to be feeding children through the summer, June, July, and into the first week of August in partnership with the YMCA. So I just lift that to you as a joy and a celebration, but also lift it to you as a prayer concern. And now will you go with me to God in prayer? O most holy and gracious God, indeed you are the God of all that was, all that is, and all that will ever be. We praise you for the mighty ways that you work and move in our lives and in our world. We thank you for all the many blessings that you just continue to pour out upon us. For friends and family, for food and shelter, for purpose and meaning in our lives, for our health and our freedom, for those who journey alongside us in this walk of faith, for the ability to join in worship even though we shelter at home. Lord, we have so much, much to be thankful for. Hear now our own individual voices of thanksgiving. For all these things and more, Lord, we give you our thanks. Let us always be thankful, God. Help us to see and recognize how you provide for us each and every day and each and every time to claim them as gifts from you. Lord, help us to be people that are grateful. God, there are just so many places where we, your children, are in need. Places of illness and grief, anxiety and depression, isolation and loneliness, 
fear and uncertainty, addiction and demons. Many of these people and situations have been shared among us just now, but God, there are so many more. Hear our individual needs and concerns now as we share them with you in the quiet of our hearts. Take each of these. Take them, Lord. Take them unto you and care for each as only you know best. And then give us a sense of assurance and peace and comfort as we give them over to you. And now, God, we offer up ourselves. Lord, we are weary. We are weary of sheltering at home. We are weary of not gathering with our faith family. We are weary of bad news. Lord, we are just weary. God, we ask that you would give us strength. Give us a breath of fresh air. Fill us with an assurance that you are in control of what feels to be chaos. Guide our thoughts. Shape our words. Show us how we can be a blessing to others. Empower us to bring light to the darkness, hope to the hopeless, smiles to the downtrodden, joy to those filled with sadness, and direction to those who wander without purpose. Use us even in these strange, uncertain, unusual times. Use us to be your ambassadors. And now, great and merciful God, hear us as we bring our voices together in prayer, sharing in the words that your Son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. I'll be reading from chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, Lord, we don't know, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does the work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. 
Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Troubled hearts. I think that's a pretty common occurrence these days. I could ask you the question this morning, is your heart troubled? And I would bet that most, if not all of you, would heave a heavy sigh and answer with the word yes. And then I could ask you, so what troubles your heart today? And I bet that lots of your answers would be similar. Fears of this COVID-19 virus, worry about you or your loved ones getting sick, the emptiness in your soul from the isolation and loneliness, fears over financial struggles or concerns, longing and wishing that you could see a loved one in the hospital or nursing home or retirement center, disappointments over missed vacations and missed milestones like birthdays and graduations, feelings of grief and loss, battles with addiction or depression or anxiety, concern over what you might think is a premature lifting of the stay-at-home order or frustration that not everything is open yet. I'd venture to say that there are more people dealing with troubled hearts now than there has been for a very long time. But just now in our scripture reading, in the very first sentence, you heard Jesus say these words, don't let your heart be troubled. Maybe you hear those words and you think, well, that's easier said than done. As we get started this morning with this message, let's set the stage for this reading and, and get the backstory for those easier said than done words that Jesus spoke. In our reading this morning, Jesus is in the upper room gathered with his disciples it's the night that Jesus and his group share in that Last Supper. Jesus has knelt before each one of them and tenderly washed their feet. And he's watched as Judas left the room to go out on his mission of betrayal. Jesus has told them that he will be with them only a little bit longer. And he has given them a new commandment that they should love one another just as he has loved them. He's predicted that Peter will deny him, not once, not twice, but three times. And now he bids farewell to these disciples. He tells them that he's leaving them and they can't go with him. Can you imagine how the disciples must have felt? These 11 men who had given up absolutely everything to follow this man. They'd left behind their jobs and their families, everything they knew to follow this man in the hopes that he was the one, that he was finally the Savior, the Messiah, who would set their people free. Just days before this night, they had been ecstatic watching as their teacher, their leader, their friend, as he triumphantly rode the city streets of Jerusalem. And they'd stood shoulder to shoulder with throngs of people who had gathered to shout loud hosannas and to cheer his triumphant entry. But now their teacher is talking about 
his death and not the coming kingdom. So you can bet these guys, these men were anxious and uneasy and for sure their hearts were troubled. And so Jesus' message in our reading this morning, as well as in all of John 14, Jesus' words were spoken to comfort them, to ease their troubled hearts, especially as they would be witness to the horrors in, that would come in the hours ahead. The words he shares with them are the words of God, the words from the Spirit, they're words of encouragement and words of consolation, words spoken to troubled hearts, troubled hearts like our own. If we listen to Jesus' words and, and truly hear what Jesus was telling his beloved disciples, and if we apply those words to our own lives, then those words can and will comfort our own troubled hearts in these troublesome days. You know, none of us get through this life without experiencing a troubled heart at some point. Neither wealth or power or opportunities, education, financial means, none of that makes us immune to experiencing a troubled heart. And I wouldn't think that any of us can look at the pain in the world today, the chaos that's been inflicted by this pandemic, the suffering of those around us, or even look at our own wounds and our own hurts and not feel a troubled heart. So in some ways, we're not that different than the disciples who were gathered there with their teacher in that upper room that night. We heard the pain in Thomas's words. He's lost and troubled and confused. He asked his teacher, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Philip's world is reeling. He's lost his center, and, and he can't see what's standing right there in front of him. In his confusion, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Confusion, reeling, lost, troubled hearts. When we hear Jesus say, don't let your hearts be troubled, I bet the disciples were thinking, are you kidding? How can you be serious about not having troubled hearts? Don't you see what's happening in our, in our lives and to our people? And that might be the same thoughts you're having now. Don't let your hearts be troubled? Really? It's not like there's an on-off switch for troubled hearts. How do we begin to make sense of today's gospel in a world where hearts are overwhelmingly troubled? If you remember last week before I read the psalm, the 23rd psalm, I mentioned to you that I couldn't think of a single funeral that I had planned or presided over that had not included the reading of those words of comfort. And the same is true for this gospel lesson this morning. Don't let your hearts be troubled. The verse is often read at funerals, and it's not hard to know why. Death troubles our hearts, and we long to find some balance and stability and comfort in times of loss. This text, though, is more than just talking about the afterlife. This, these words, this text has something very relevant to say about our here and our now. It speaks to the very circumstances that trouble our hearts today. Think about times when your heart has been troubled, maybe in the past or maybe right this moment. What does that feel like? 
We all experience it in our own ways, but see if any of this sounds familiar. Paralyzed, isolated, overwhelmed, powerless, off kilter or out of control, disconnected or afraid, thoughts spinning wildly in your head or no stability, feelings of despair or grief, lots of tears and maybe even anger. Do any of those words sound familiar to you? I bet if you're like me, you found yourself in that list somewhere. In the midst of a troubled heart, the unspoken question is often this, will the center hold or is everything going to collapse around me? Thomas and Philip were feeling that collapse in our reading this morning. And much of our world is feeling it today. And maybe you are too. Maybe you're asking yourself questions like, will the center hold or will everything collapse around me? But here again, Jesus' words, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus knows our hearts are troubled. He can see it in us. And he knows what it feels like because his own heart was troubled. And he also knows that the world and even our own lives are not defined by or controlled by or limited to what troubles us. What if not letting our hearts be troubled begins with looking at our hearts and seeing and naming what those troubles are. That would mean honestly looking at ourselves and our lives, but that might be the first and most important and yet most difficult thing that Jesus is asking us to do in today's gospel. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't want to see or name what's troubling me. I don't want to put a name to it. It's too hard and it's too painful. Sometimes it's because if you name it, it makes it real. It takes us too close to the edge of the abyss. It's just too risky. Maybe you feel that way too. Maybe you think that naming exactly what's troubling your heart might mean free falling into a collapse. I think Thomas speaks for us all when he says, how can we know the way? We are troubled. It seems like we might have lost our center. And if that's the case, how do we recenter ourselves? Where do we go when it seems like everything is in chaos and everything is collapsing around us? There's a bit of irony here. There's a bit of a paradox. And that is this, sometimes we have to lose our center in order to better find it. Now, let me be clear about something here. I am not suggesting that God purposely uncenters us. Sometimes uncentering just happens. It's part of life. It's part of the human condition. Sometimes it seems to come out of nowhere and it comes from situations that we did not create and we certainly did not choose. But other times it comes as a consequence of our own choices and our own actions and our own behaviors. But regardless, Jesus says that's not a place to stay or a, or a way to live. When I talk to people who are struggling or in hard places or in dark seasons, I often tell them 
that they cannot unpack their bags and stay there. Because that's not the life our Creator wants for us. If your heart is troubled, as so many are right now, then maybe it's a time for you to recenter. But hear this. Recentering does not mean that the troubles go away. It doesn't necessarily fix the problem, whatever that might be. But it does mean that our lives are grounded and centered in something greater than ourselves. It means that our hearts are held secure by the loving embrace of the mighty God, the God of grace and the God of mercy. And it means that we are being held so not to free fall into that abyss. Jesus is reminding us in these words that there is a center and it is not us. It's not in our power or position. It's not in our controlling the situation. It's not in our successes or our accomplishments. We are not the center, nor are we able to construct a center. Instead, we have to become aware. We have to awaken to the center. We have to intentionally seek it out and we have to name it, and we have to claim it. And that center is this. The center is the Father's house. The center is living with God. The center is living in God. And the center is allowing God to live in you. You see, the Father's house is within. The kingdom is within. Wherever you go and whatever you face, there's the center. Whoever you are and regardless of what troubles your heart, there's the center. Wherever you find yourself, there's the center. Not because you are the center, but because God is within you and you are living in the Father's house. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Instead, move into the Father's house and unpack your bags and stay there. Amen. And now I have a communication that I received yesterday from the bishop. The bishop asked that this be read as we conclude our worship time together. I'm going to be reading a portion of the letter that I received, and it goes like this. Bishop Bill McAlilly and the Nashville Area Cabinet of the Tennessee Memphis Conferences worked prayerfully together to make missional appointments to every church in our annual conference. I am happy to share that Reverend DeLee Harville will be returning as your pastor for the 2020-2021 conference year. I hope you are as relieved and, and joyous as I am to receive those news, that news. And now he offered a prayer at the conclusion of his letter, so will you bow with me? Lord, as we begin a new appointment year, Open our hearts and minds to receive the gifts you have for us in these days as we give thanks for what has been and anticipate what will be. Our life is in you, O God, and through the Holy Spirit we pray this day. Amen. And now, dear ones, receive your benediction. As we get ready to close out our time together, hear again the comforting words of our Savior. Don't let your hearts be troubled. May those words bring you comfort and peace in these uncertain, troubled times. And may you find the strength in knowing that Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, is with you this day and forevermore. Amen. 
And now as we wrap this up, I bid you three things. Stay safe, take care of yourself and your loved ones, and above all things, keep the faith. Bye now.